like to welcome everyone. And just so I remember, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank the stores for creating the endowment that has made this visit by Dr. or Professor Leah Edelstein Keshet possible. And uh, Leah got her bachelor's degree from Dalhousie University, which is in Eastern Canada, if you don't know, in 1974. She got her PhD from the Weizmann Institute, working with Lee Siegel, one of the preeminent mathematical biologists and one of the world's uh, nicest and most wonderful people besides. Uh, and uh, also, his, his sense of humor was beyond compare. And uh, Leah's had a very, very distinguished career. She's uh, currently at the University of British Columbia, and uh, before that, she was at Duke. In 1995, she was elected as the president of the Society for Mathematical Biology. And the citation she got when she became a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, I think sums it up very well. I want to say just a word or two about it. It was for contributions to the mathematics and modeling of the cell, the immune system, and biological swarms, as well as to applied mathematics education. One of the things I'd like to say is that there are the kinds of applied mathematicians who work in biology but don't really tie it enough to the biology. And then there are kinds who really tie it tightly to biology but work in relatively narrowly within biology. And Leah has worked, as that citation suggests, across many levels of organization and has done so really tying the biology to the mathematics, really answering very important biological questions. And as well, I know that many of you are very familiar with her uh, superb book on mathematical modeling in biology, which is a SIAM classic now, and uh, many people have really profited from reading that book. And so I don't want to take any more time away from Leah, and uh, she will be talking about from single to collective cell motility, what can we learn using mathematics? Thank you. So first of all, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Hopefully everything's good. All right. Um, I'm really honored to be invited to give this um, colloquium. And uh, I had a look at some of the previous speakers and noted that there were Nobel laureates. So it makes me feel a little bit, uh, let's say, self-conscious. Um, the other thing I should say is I know there's a few mathematicians in the audience. I've worked hard to get rid of equations from this talk because my understanding was that this is a public biology talk. So we'll see how, how well that goes. Now, before I go further in, I'll point to the fact that this is a simulation and this is a picture of real cells and they are color-coded by the cell size. So I'll have more to say about this uh, during my talk. First of all, I want to give credit to many wonderful people who I've worked with who've contributed to the kind of work I'll describe. So some of them were previous postdocs, others were previous PhD students, Sasha, Adriana, Corey, and so on. All of these, um, most of them are now uh, graduated. The only one that's left to graduate is Cole, and he's going to defend his thesis at the end of this summer. Okay, now. Let me tell you a little bit about what I see math as doing uh, for biology. So often in molecular biology, you have basically uh, a parts list. You have a list of components that you know are important in the cell. And the question is, can you somehow figure out, given that parts list, how does the cell or the system as a whole behave? Another type of question why might one might ask is, if you see the behavior of a cell and you know some components that make it up, can you somehow infer how are those components working together? How are they interacting? What are they actually doing to bring about that behavior? And so math, I think, can play a role precisely in bridging that gap. In particular, in cell biology, you'll see that some of the questions I ask include, if we know something about a signaling network, what is, its, what is its role in affecting cell behavior? Or, stated another, from another perspective, if you see cell behavior, 
can you somehow infer what the signaling networks are doing, how they are uh, bringing about that behavior. So what kind of behavior am I referring to? Let me show a few examples. So one of these is a classic movie that I'm sure many of you have seen many times, Neutrophil Chasing a Bacterium. Uh, this is way back in the 1950s when this was first uh, filmed. And the main idea here is you see a cell moving. You see the front edge uh, reforming and distorting so that the whole cell can be propelled forward. You also see chemotaxis. These are HeLa cells in a microfluidic chamber. And this has to do with experiments done by Ben Lin in a joint work with um, Andrew, Andrei Levchenko's lab a few years ago. And those cells are chemotaxing. They're being attracted by a molecule called rapamycin. And they've had a special construct in them that allows them uh, to do so. Finally, these are uh, melanoma cells with some um, unusual behavior. And the example I, just, I had earlier on my, um, as a movie comes from the lab of um, Angelini and basically shows that in uh, a tissue, you sometimes see oscillations or behavior where cells successively grow and shrink in size. So these are just some of the phenomena that I find interesting and that I've uh, spent time studying. So some of the specific questions that uh, we ask are, what are the mechanisms that can explain these sort of behaviors? And how do the cell type and environment both somehow jointly affect the cell shape, the cell motility, changes in that, um, uh, those attributes of the cell. So let me give you a sort of a, a extremely simplified caricature of how we view the cells from, I guess you could say, a mathematician's perspective. So here it is, a bag of fluids and goodies, right, with a nucleus. However, we know that the nucleus is basically a passive cargo when it comes to cell shape or cell motility. And in fact, we know that it's the edge of the cell, the lamellipod, that governs the ability of the cell to move, change its shape, and so on. And that relies heavily on actomyosin, right? So the cytoskeleton, actin, and the motor proteins, namely myosin, uh, really play a dominant role in the shape and the motility of the cell. And so when the cell moves, for example, different things happen in the front and the back. So typically, you'd have protrusion due to growth of actin filaments that push out the front edge of a cell. By the way, Alex McGillner, who was a former member of the math department here, uh, has worked extensively on this sort of um, uh, uh, modeling of this behavior. And of course, at the rear of the cell, we've got contraction pulling up of the back and that's facilitated by actomyosin, contraction of um, myosin. Now, we know that there's a great deal of detail that uh, is important in this behavior. For example, actin itself has many proteins that coordinate its nucleation, its growth, its branching, the fact that it pushes out at the edge of the cell. But this somehow has to get regulated. So it's not good for a cell to have uncontrolled actin dynamics throughout. Somehow this has to be focused at the front edge to produce cell motility. And so all this is controlled by uh, signaling networks, basically. Networks, proteins that talk to either the actin or the myosin or both to somehow coordinate this and make sure that it's spatially and temporally regulated. This is really where, um, where I work in this general area. Now, this, of course, looks like a, to you, biologists, a highly oversimplified view of the cell. To me, an extremely complicated weave of interacting components. And the basic idea is you want to figure out how does all this work together in space and time? How does it actually 
produce the right behavior at the right part of the cell, and also in a timely manner. And so what I'm going to tell you about is some of the work we've done on a certain subset of these signaling proteins, namely proteins that are known to somehow talk to or interact with actin and myosin. And these are the small GTPases, also called Rho GTPases, CDC42, RAC, and Rho. And as you see, many of these funnel sim um, stimulus and funnel information to the actin cytoskeleton. So they receive stimuli from receptors in the cell membrane. There's transduction that happens, and eventually this somehow coordinates the uh, cytoskeleton. Now, it's interesting that these proteins in and of themselves are known to have interesting spatial and temporal behavior. So just as one example, this is RAC, RAC1, and as you see in cells that are hemotaxing, same kind of cells that I showed in an earlier slide, HeLa cells, again from the same uh, paper with Ben Lin, uh, you see that these get high levels of RAC activity shown here in red as time goes by, and particularly at the front of the cell. And it turns out that RAC actually um, orchestrates the nucleation of actin filaments and their growth. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to do actually was try and see can we somehow understand this behavior and hook together a model that would recapitulate it or allow us to tease it apart. And so I'll very briefly mention that we spent a couple of years combing through a bunch of papers and putting together network diagrams and simulating it in, um, in a motile cell, a model cell. And as a proof of concept, we were actually able to get behavior that seemed reasonable. So what are we seeing here? We see a cell, by the way, the color here represents the level of some GTPAs, level of activity from high in white to low in black. This happens to be CDC42, but it could easily be any of the others. So what, what we're seeing is that the cell initially gets stimulated and it polarizes very quickly so that the chemical redistributes lots in the front, little activity in the back. That in turn facilitates actin growth that pushes out the front of the cell and the cell changes its shape. And in fact, you can even get it to reorient if you prov prov provide it with stimuli from a new direction. So that was a sort of proof of concept that it can be done. And in fact, we even went into more detail with adding layers to the GTPases that essentially fine-tuned that behavior. So uh, that whole work was in a way, what can we do based on information in the literature? How can we assemble something that seems at least to be plausible? But even this I find to be rather um, complex. So uh, I'll skip that since we've, we see it basically here. I can just mention that it turned out that there's a layer of lipids that fine-tunes the ability of these proteins to polarize, and it, in fact, it allows the cell to decide which way to go rather than tear itself apart. Okay, what were some of the things that we managed to thereby understand? Well. We got a model cell that responded to stimulus by polarizing its chemistry. We were able to have it actually change shape and reorient to new stimuli and undergo chemotaxis. And all this, I should mention, was fairly robust to parameter variations, which is good because we picked parameters that were a composite from many different cells. And that brings me to some of the issues with this approach of modeling. Namely, back then, essentially, we combed the literature for everything that was known, and so the assumptions, the details of the model, the parameter values were, in a sense, a composite from many cell types. And so you can complain, of course, that no one real cell actually behaves this way. 
Nevertheless, the fact that it was relatively robust did teach us that uh, this system has some robustness built into it, which was a good thing. So what I'll talk to you about today is our effort to get rid of some of that complexity and to ask, can we somehow replace this very complex weave of signaling networks by a few key modules that we can study in detail, understand mathematically inside out and backwards, understand therefore from an intuitive level, and then use that understanding and these methods to actually say something about more detailed, more interesting actual biological systems. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And I'm going to focus attention on just one of these road GTPases. Let's say WAC. Or it could be any of the others. Now, the one thing that we found out pretty quickly um, about the behavior of these proteins is that it's absolutely vital that they keep cycling between an active and an inactive form. Somehow the system doesn't work if you prevent this. And later I'll mention why we think that's the case. Uh, in what I talked about, talk about today, mostly I'm going to talk about well-mixed uh, models, which means either think of focusing attention on just one small compartment in the cell or something that's completely homogeneous spatially, just because a lot of the examples are simpler to explain. I will say a few things about the spatially distributed case as well. So the first thing we realized is that if you simply have constant rates of exchange between these two forms of the GTPAs, not too much interesting can happen if you vary these rates slightly. For example, here I show variations in the rate K1. Well, then in that case, the steady state activity level would creep upwards and it would maybe get to some maximum but you wouldn't really have a state of high activity, which is very, very distinct from a state of low activity in the same cell. So this is the sort of what mathematicians call linear model, <clears throat> would not give you a very interesting switch-like behavior. However, by a small additional assumption, we can find something that behaves more interestingly, namely if you have positive feedback, from the active form of the GTPAs to its own rate of activation, then you're in business. Now, that feedback could go through one of several points. The proteins that activate are called GEFs. Those that inactivate the GTPAs are called uh, GAPs. So you could either enhance the GEFs or depress the GAPs, or you could uh, signal uh, positive feedback through some other intermediates that eventually make it back here. So the details don't matter, and that's, that's really something that mathematically we can uh, say quite clearly. And then all of a sudden you're able to have cells such that when you vary, um, when you vary one of these parameters, you actually get a sharp response. Now, what I'm actually showing here is the rate of activation as a function of the current level of activity. And let me show you what this allows us to uh, obtain. So first of all, it allows us to have cells which are in very different levels of activity. So think of two cells having exactly the same little module inside them. They can exist in a low or a high level of activity. and if you slightly change that activity, you will return to one or another of these states. So in math lingo, we call these steady states. And these arrows are simply showing a kind of dynamic behavior that if you change things a little bit, you don't break them. You simply return to those states. However, the cell could encounter different environments, different temperatures, different inputs. So in principle, if you change one of the parameters, these states of the cell could also change as well. And in particular, it's possible that there is a parameter or a range of values of parameters 
where you could have both low and high GTPase activity coexisting in the same cell. Again, each one of these being a stable steady state. So this type of behavior we call bistability, and it's, um, for mathematicians, it's sort of like extremely common uh, behavior that we study. And this zone of overlap is particularly interesting because it tells us that there are cases where in a single cell we can get either one of the two behaviors. In fact, which behavior we get depends on where we start. So um, if the activity le level starts off over here somewhere, it will be attracted to this low level. If it starts up high, it may be attracted to some other uh, high level. So this, this is a short uh, caricature of the uh, slides I just gave earlier, which summarizes this idea of bistability and also the idea of hysteresis, which is that history matters. Where you were to begin with will affect your uh, final state. Now, why is this interesting or relevant? Later, I will describe this pattern of rho GTPases that forms around a wound in a single cell. And what you see is in that wound, you've got background level, which is shown by in the dark color here. And then you've got uh, high intensity zone near the wound. And all this coexists in the same cell. So for example, the background level would be the level of activity of the GTPase shown by this branch of the diagram, whereas the level within the zone is uh, the high intensity, high activity level. Uh, let me mention just briefly, and again, I won't focus too much on this, but we did study this spatially, and we found that it was very important that the active form of GTPases is bound to a cell membrane. And the key reason why it's important is because components that are somehow floating in the membrane will diffuse across the cell much more slowly than if they are in the cytosol, given the same size um, and, and et cetera. In other words, um, the differences in diffusion uh, turns out to be a key factor that distinguishes the behavior of these two forms. So together with a former postdoc, Yoichiro uh, Mori, and a former PhD student, Sasha Zhilkin, we actually studied this in a spatial setting where we showed that actually you could get a wave of activation that polarizes and freezes in the cell. Think of this as a chymograph. The time axis is this way. You start off with things being homogeneous, as shown here, and you end up over here with a cell that has a high level of activity at one end and a low level at the other. Namely, this can, can explain cell polarization. But as I said, I'm not going to focus too much attention on that. Rather, I'm going to tell you um, briefly about a few vignettes in which tuning by other factors other components of the cell gives rise to interesting behavior. So the first one is feedback from actin to the GTPases. So this is something that we studied a while ago. Um, this slide is out of order. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll skip it for now. Feedback from F actin. OK. So this is something we studied a while ago in a completely abstract setting where we took the same little active, inactive, GTPase module and hooked it up to F-actin. So for instance, we know that RAC can stimulate actin assembly. On the other hand, F-actin might cause inactivation of the GTPases. And so that allows us to have a transition from something that polarizes and just gets stuck to something that produces more interesting wave-like patterns. So at the time, this was a purely abstract model. But it turns out that this actually applies in a real system to some extent. And so this is work from the lab of Ed Monroe. Uh, Robin is the lead author here. Ed studies C. elegans embryos. And he looks at clusters of contractile actomyosin 
that appear and disappear on the time scale of, uh, I think it's uh, seconds. You can see one pulse here as it uh, grows and shrinks in time, actin, myosin, and uh, this is the merge. And he's been able on a molecular basis, single molecule basis, to track the actin, the myosin, uh, the rho, and a gap, a protein that inactivates uh, rho. And he's put together this sort of a caricature. This part right here is precisely the type of little module that we've studied. Uh, then the F actin is assembled by rho. It recruits RGA34, which is a gap which turns off the rho GTP. And you see that there are cycles. All of a sudden, you're able to uh, understand why these things uh, become contractile. Now, why does this happen? Let's uh, think about that. So if you look just at this module, then that the behavior of it is basically it's bistable. It can exist in a high row activity state or a low row activity state. Right? As soon as you hook together other influences, then basically what you're doing is you're moving up one of these branches, and eventually that steady state no longer exists. You make a rapid transition to the high steady state, and then you move down and so forth. So the rest of this circuit is basically governing where you are in this diagram. And put together, this allows the oscillations that um, occur. And this theme, as simple as it is to mathematicians, turns out to have powerful consequences in many biological settings, as I hope to um, uh, describe. So the next little vignette that I'd like to uh, talk about is feedback from the mechanics. So we take the same little abstract model of a GTPase, and next we're going to say what happens when the cell receives some mechanical stimulus. So we're going to hook together the same elementary module for the GTPase together with something that senses tension and mechanics in the cell. This, by the way, is uh, just published in Physical Biology, and Cole, uh, my current PhD student, is the lead author. So what's the idea here? So the basic idea, think about it this way, that all these signaling networks somehow receive stimuli from receptors that can sense tension, from some kind of upstream effectors that can sense pulling, whether it's um, uh, a variety of receptors that let in uh, change conformation and let, uh, let in various signals. Those signaling networks, in turn, produce the effects on cell shapes, such as contraction or protrusion, but that changes the tension that the cell feels. And so there's a, a feedback, as I will uh, demonstrate. So think of the spring-like quantity or the attribute of the cell that's being represented by a spring as being those contractile actomyosin fibers that can grow, shrink, or contract. And these two things are now going to talk to each other. So for example, rho A is known to activate rho kinase, which in turn activates myosin, which causes contraction. So that would be how a rho A module might affect this. And this in turn causes the cell to contract, and it pulls and creates tension. So here's the basic idea of how um, this is put together. So think of a resting cell. It has some kind of a length or area. Now an external force comes along and stretches that cell so that it feels that it's in tension. It has a new length. That activates a whole bunch of rho, which causes contraction. All of a sudden, the cell is smaller. When it's smaller, the tension has lowered, the row gets inactivated on some time scale, it relaxes, 
but then there's the possibility that it would go back to rest and the cycle can repeat. Or the cell could be stuck in one or another of these states. So let's see what actually happens. So it turns out that when you hook together this model, and it really is extremely elementary, it consists of the same model I described earlier with a spring mass type system. It turns out that you can either get a cell that's large and has a lot of, sorry, it has a high, a large length and a low level of the GTPAs. G here stands for the GTPAs, like rho. Or it can be contracted, small length and um, high level of the GTPAs. Or it can undergo these successive oscillations. So think of it as basically something that's doing sort of like this, relaxing and contracting. Okay, once we figured out what happens on a single cell basis, we said, what, what about when we hook together cells in a row? How are they going to influence one another? And what happens when one of them pulls on its neighbor? Uh, what will happen in the tissue? For example, an epithelium or a row of cells, each of which has exactly the same inbuilt type of uh, dynamics. So it turns out, let me orient you to what you see here. Time is on this axis. Think of a row of cells. I'm showing three cells here, and then there's the fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. This is many cells in a row. The black lines are the edges of those cells. And here what you see is cells contracting and expanding in synchrony. And you also see the color, which represents the level of the GTPAs inside the cells. So for instance, the cells start out spread out. They all contract. Now all of them are high GTPAs and small length. Then they expand. They relax again. And the pattern continues. So you actually find that there are several types of behavior in a system like this. You can, in certain parameter regimes, have the cells all of uniformly large length, uniformly small. This is because each cell has exactly the same copy of this model. Or you can get oscillations. You can even have waves of contraction going through the cell. Now, why is a simple model like this um, interesting? Well, mathematically, we can understand it in exact detail. So we can create bifurcation diagrams, and we can predict exactly where each of these behaviors will occur and what sort of transitions there are between one and another. So even though this is far divorced from the full complexity of the cell, it allows us to gain full understanding and intuition of at least this uh, stripped-down um, another thing that's interesting, even when you look at the sort of one-dimensional realization of this, you see that there can be sort of waves in a row of cells, where cells expand and contract and sort of inchworm their way across, right? So um, when we saw this, we kind of said, oh, well, it reminds us of certain biological behavior, in particular in certain developmental systems. So here's one example of a developmental system where things like this may be at play, even though clearly the system is more complicated. Again, this is from the lab of Edmund Rowe. And here he's looking at the development of an ascidian and a process called zippering. And so I should have worn a top with a zipper so you could see the way that this thing behaves. But essentially, as it develops, these two sides kind of close up successively to form this little hoodie um, embryo shape. Now, if you look at this at the edge of the zipper, so look at one edge. That's what he shows here. These are actual outlines of real cells. And what you see is successive waves of contraction and relaxation going up this embryo. It's actually really apparent in the movie, less so in this picture. But you actually see this wave going up the organism, 
It's also known that rho is essential, myosin contraction is essential, and so a lot of the components of the system are known and we can begin to now take our intuition and build a more careful uh, model of this type of behavior. Uh, simulations, I've show, showed this in the beginning of the talk, let me show it one more time. So here we've hooked up exactly the same thing only in two dimensions and instead of a cell having a length, it has an area which expands and contracts. In the beginning of my talk, what you saw was color coding for cell area. Here I'm showing color coding for the chemical level, the level of rho or the GTPase in the tissue. And you see that this very elementary mechanism gives rise to very interesting waves of contraction and expansion that's kind of reminiscent of things that are uh, seen in development. By the way, this simulation is coded in CompuCell 3D, which is a publicly available uh, platform that anybody can um, play with. And I started using this a few summers ago. I put some undergrads to work on trying out this CompuCell 3D, and, and eventually we, we arrived at this. Okay, um, let me give you how am I doing for time? See, I, I talk until the hour. Is that right? OK. I'll finish a bit early for questions and so on. OK, let me tell you about a third vignette. And this has to do with work that was done in collaboration with Andrew Levchenko. And uh, it's about the extracellular matrix. I should mention that in this vignette, we're now looking at two components, rack and row, which have been known to be mutually antagonistic in cells. And a lot of known, is known about the downstream effects. Uh, briefly, Rho, as I mentioned before, uh, facilitates or regulates cell contraction, as well as some actin assembly. And RAC uh, is responsible for cell spreading and protrusion, as well as actin assembly. So uh, RAC and Rho, I can tell you, I can give you a whole hour talk on that. I, I won't do that, I promise. But just briefly, it's known that when you have a lot of rack in a cell or high rack activity, the cell tends to be uh, uh, spread out. When you have a lot of row activity, it tends to be contracted. And then somewhere in the middle, there is um, a balance, and the cell can be polarized with rack at one end and row activity at the back. Uh, so this work uh, involved Jin Suk Park, who was a postdoc with Andrew Levchenko, as well as Bill Holmes, a previous postdoc of mine. And what was done by Jin Suk was he took melanoma cells and grew them on these topographic surfaces, which are meant to mimic input from the extracellular matrix. And that Input could be either isotropic or anisotropic with different density of posts and so on. And he was able to see a variety of behaviors. Let me turn this on. Which included a kind of oscillatory back and forth motion, random motion, as well as persistent polarized motion in the cells. And all this depended on whereabouts in the topographic surface, what sort of surface the cells encountered. And in fact, um, each one of these had some fraction of cells that were of each of these types. So you could manipulate the fractions by changing the topography or by changing <coughs> other uh, chemical uh, or genetic manipulations. OK, saw that. Uh, so I also want to mention that a lot can be done in this experimental system by using either drugs or other manipulations to knock out various things and to see what's the behavior of the system. Now, what we did is we first considered this central module of row and rack, and it turns out that exactly the same type of idea of bistability 
applies to the way that these guys interact as well. So you can have cells that have high RAC, and in that case, you'd have low rho, or vice versa, or you could have cells that can exist in either one of the two uh, states as before. Now, what does the ECM do? So it was argued by Andrei Levchenko that, first of all, the ECM will upregulate rho, but when rho is upregulated, it causes the cell to contract, which means it gets less stimuli from the ECM. It has a lower contact area. On the other hand, if you have a lot of RAC in the cell, that causes the cell to spread, which increases the um, input and signaling from the ECM. You can think of this variable as basically being synonymous both with cell area and with input from the ECM. And so the model we looked at basically had two lamellopods, each of them having this rho rack module in them, each receiving input and uh, coupling the two lamellopods so that uh, they couldn't each expand um, with, without affecting the other. So it turns out that indeed you can account for both persistent cells as well as oscillatory behavior with dependence on the parameters as well as a random state. And those parameters can be interpreted in terms of the drugs that are applied. So for example, uh, if rock is knocked out, turn, it turns out that um, the uh, experiment can account for Sorry, the model can account for the, both this type of uh, knockout as well as for um, the second. Let me back up here. So if you knock out rock, you increase the percentage of polarized cells at the expense of the oscillatory cells. Similarly, if you have more aggressive melanoma cells, it turns out that this is upregulated. In that case, the oscillatory cells are the fraction are increased at the expense of polarized cells. You can understand both of these in terms of some of these so-called bifurcation diagrams. So if you think of the, what rock inhibition does in the model, which parameter it affects, it turns out that you're moving from a parameter regime that has a dominantly oscillatory mode to a polarized mode, and similarly, if you upregulate PI3K, you're moving this way in the parameter regime. So the model allows you to understand some of these experimental observations. Okay, so here's a summary of some of the things that we've learned in that setting. First of all, the GTPS dynamics are what give you the polarity and by stability of the system, but the ECM input is what allows you to actually observe these oscillatory feedback. It acts as a slow negative feedback, which gives these oscillations. And so you can actually capture all of these diverse behaviors by a relatively clear-cut, stripped-down uh, model. Uh, I won't say much about this, but only in the, the last couple of minutes to say that We've also used some of what we've learned to help other biologists like Bill Bement study single cell wounds where GTPases are visualized and where he can actually knock out things. And we've been helping him to decipher the full circuit uh, that uh, plays a role in that behavior. And we've also been able to, just by looking at bifurcation diagrams for this model, start to understand what certain other agents can be doing. So for instance, PKC beta was known to experimentally to brighten the row zone while leaving the background in a cell the same. So we can look at our distinct bifurcation diagrams with respect to different parameters in the system, and we can say, well, that's not what this is showing, because here we see that the background level does go up if we vary this parameter. While in this case, if we vary this feedback parameter, uh, 
the background level stays more or less the same, while the upper steady state, uh, in fact, increases in intensity. So we can use these to argue what some of the uh, ingredients in the whole picture are, uh, are doing. OK, so I'm essentially at the end. Um, I think I've said all of this already. Let me just move to my conclusions. So I hope I've persuaded you that math can be used as a tool to help us in our understanding of biological systems and to bridge levels of description. So if we know something about the molecular level to say something at the level of the cell and vice versa. And the fact that um, even though these simple models are really nowhere near as complex as the cell, if we can somehow get insight from them, we can apply that insight to learning things about the cell as a whole. And really, the best part of the whole picture is working together with biologists and making these discoveries. And with that, I will thank you and um, conclude my talk. GTPAs, yes, in the size of the cell. Yep, uh-huh. Um, so I saw that they were in, I think, like the maximum of one corresponded to the minimum of the other. And yet on the, I think on one of the subsequent figures, uh, it was that figure of the one-dimensional array of cells in, through time. And the, the GTPAs uh, was suddenly turned off as it was, as the cell was increasing in size and suddenly turned back on as it was decreasing in size. So I'm curious. Those were slightly different variants of the model. Yeah. So, yeah, the movie was made from a slightly older variant. Yeah. I didn't have one uh, for the new version to show, so. Yes. So you showed up crystallized earlier and you had a good talk. So, uh, Thank you. Light bulbs off in my head. And I studied neutrophil migration and you showed a movie of that. And um, so this relates to the fact that with many of the models that you show where you demonstrate this bi-stability, um, you, you say you're looking at well-mixed systems and, and the things that sort of generate the dynamics are largely maybe um, uh, tethered to the membrane. In neutrophils, I think it's a much more dynamic system. They move much quicker than these other cells. So do you have, does your model take into account diffusion? I mean, yes. for instance, calcium flux causes yes. a lot of the... Right, so absolutely. So I completely left out a one-hour lecture that could have fit in the middle, which definitely takes into account diffusion of the proteins across the cell, both in the membrane and in the cytosol, and that explains things like polarization. So I hinted at it, but I left it out. Definitely we do uh, consider that. So what I presented today was really just um, one line of thought where everything was either well-mixed or uh, in a small compartment in the cell so that space was not important. But definitely we've looked at a lot of this spatially. Yeah. So migration within a three-dimensional matrix is going to be very different than on a flat culture. And a lot of yep. people are starting to look at these three-dimensional matrices. Are you starting to model the differences there? Yeah, that's a fascinating problem, which um, I know everyone's interested in. A lot harder to study. But in a way, many of these cells are still walking along fibers or somehow between fibers. They still have a front and, and a trailing edge. So a lot of the same kind of things are going to happen, but in a different geometry. We haven't personally looked at that yet. I think going from uh, 1D to 2D is already like, oh, wow. Um, so that, that'll be the next thing uh, many years later. Alan, you had a question? Uh, so th this may, I hope this isn't an unfair question, but typically when we hear about mathematical models like this, it comes out beautifully, everything works, 
but that's not really how you do it. You went down a number of wrong pathways. Absolutely. Do you want to comment about that? For sure. So, absolutely. So, uh, when we first started looking at GTPases, and it was known that they can polarize, and it was known they could do this even if you get rid of the actin, you, you apply drugs so that the cell is, you know, not got any F actin in it. So, we knew it was inherent to the GTPases. So, we started hooking up PDE models for them, and it didn't work. And I can tell you why it didn't work. I think I might, let me see if I still have that figure which I left out. So hold on, let me see if I can find it. Uh, yes, I do have it. So that's what happened, right? So what you're seeing here is uh, time is going downwards. And over here, time is going downwards. We start the cell off with some GTPase activity at one end. The red is the high level. It sweeps through. It takes over the whole cell. It's not polarized. The whole cell has high GTPase. We couldn't get it to work. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Then, Sasha looked up and found out that actually there's an active form bound to the membrane, and the inactive form is in the cytosol. As soon as we put that in, it worked. Bam, right? So this fact that uh, this, this was a crucial fact, once we figured that out, then immediately you got the behavior you were looking for. Yeah. So there was a lot of that. At the moment, but we're also, I have a new pulse doc and we're looking at adhesion coupling um, and we're also interested in properties that endow cells with the ability to be leader cells versus um, uh, follower cells. We're interested in epithelial to mesenchymal transition. We've, we're working with somebody at UBC Cal Ross Kelly on that. Uh, but that's very new. So the multi-cell stuff is really uh, in the last year. It's very, very new. Another question. No, thank you. Thank you.